Hi guys, this is Ramon Goose, and in this video we're going to be looking at the history of Jeff Beck's effects pedals. In 1964, when Jeff was playing for the Tridents, a key component to his sound was the Binson Echorec, a device he first began experimenting with during 1962, when it first arrived on the UK market. The Binson was rather expensive. At £140, it was more costly than a Vox AC30 amp. But for Jeff, the Binson's ability to provide up to 12 echo settings, plate and room reverbs and valve compression meant he had personal access to the same sonic palette as his hero, Les Paul. Jeff says, the crowds didn't always want straight blues. They wanted sci-fi noises as well. And that was all right with me. Beck also used a clamp echolet, which allowed him to program alternate delays of an eighth quarter and half a second's duration and even create rudimentary loops. Unfortunately, this device was prone to temperature changes, meaning that, as Jeff would later say, the tape would snap halfway through the first number and all my tricks were gone. Jeff actually got a bit of criticism around this time for what people perceived was his dependency on such effects to create his sound. And to counteract these claims, Jeff reportedly played part of one gig with a Spanish acoustic fed through a vocal mic to prove his doubters wrong. Jeff had to deal with feedback on stage and realised he could control it and loved the idea of noise coming from nowhere. He let the delayed sound build and build. When Jeff was later asked in an interview about his use of echoes, he says, that came from the Tridents. When we played at Il Pai, that was my party piece. I played through a Binson Echorec and I would set a very long delay and play tricks with that. Put the guitar on top of the amp so that it would feed back into the echo unit and then change the speed of the echo, like a radio frequency thing. Oh, they loved all that. I might even start doing that again. When Jeff Beck played the Eel Pie Club on 16th of September 1964 in Twickenham, he was using possibly his first ever fuzz box. It was designed and built by the bassist Paul Lucas. And in attendance at that concert was David Bowie, who revealed that it was a trident with Jeff Beck that he had specifically come to the island to see. Paul Lucas indeed pointed out that as far as he was aware that the first fuzz box that Jeff Beck ever played through was at this Eel Pie Island club gig. He designed and constructed it and it was put together using a passive mixer box and incorporated a transistor amplifier powered by a PP3 battery. This was the original design but it was later modified to become a compressor pedal. In 1965, Jeff left the Tridents to join the Yardbirds. According to Beck, one minor irritation came when he was told to disconnect his beloved Echo. They said, get rid of the Echo. No one uses Echo in Chicago Blues. They actually said that. Despite this gaping hole in the band's understanding of Buddy Guy's recording techniques, Beck took the job. Richie Blackmore was quoted as saying, Jeff was all about the Telecasters and Echoes. And Jeff stayed with them for almost two years. And their first hit used a harpsichord. Their second hit had sitar and tabla, as well as introducing the foot switchable guitar pedal known as the Solar Sound Tone Bender. So in 1965, Jeff was using the Mark I Tone Bender with the Yardbirds. Gary Hurst has stated Jeff was one of the early users of the wood boxed tone benders and came into Macari's often. According to Gary, Jeff used to crush the wooden boxes on stage, inspiring the sturdier metal-cased Mark I version that came later. The Yardbirds' follow-up to For Your Love was Heart Full of Soul. This was another melancholy gem penned by Graham Goldman. This was recorded at a session at London's AdVision Studios. For this session, they brought in an Indian sitarist and tabla player to augment the song's undulating riff. Jeff says, I remember the session well. The sitarist couldn't play in straight 4-4. Instead, he was playing it in some weird time signature, like 18-4. Jeff's solution was reductionist, but inspired. Beck says, well, hold on. I could do that sound on the guitar. And then he disappeared for a while, knowing that Jimmy Page was working on a session in an adjacent studio. Jeff asked to borrow his friend's Roger Mayer-made fuzz box for experimental purposes. Though Mayer's device was still being perfected by the designer at the time, its impressive ability to simultaneously distort and sustain notes allowed Beck to replicate the wide sweep 
of the sitar's 20 odd strings with just two of his own. It sounded outrageous, I could create the D drone and the octave above, so from my point of view, job done. Jeff later returned to the Advision Studios with his own pedal, probably a Solar Sound Tone Bender Mark I. Keith Richards' use of the fuzz box on the Rolling Stones' I Can't Get No Satisfaction was released only weeks before Heart Full of Soul. The British music magazine Be Instrumental reported the Super Fuzz as brand new in February 1967, but the unit had evidently been available for quite some time already. And here we can see Jeff Beck filmed with one of these units in October 1966, whilst performing with the Yardbirds for a scene in the 1966 film Blow Up. The Who and Steve Howe's band Tomorrow had declined invitations to appear, so the Yardbirds were the third choice. Jeff Beck was asked to smash a guitar into an amp like Pete Townsend, which he did. When Beck is stomping his foot on the guitar, a Marshall Super Fuzz can be seen on the floor in front of his speaker cabinet. In this photo here we can see Jimmy Page playing the bass on the left and Jeff Beck playing the lead guitar with the Yardbirds on the right. This is from June 1966 and the pedal on the floor is a tone bender in the Mark II style case, positioned in front of a Vox amp. The Marshall Super Fuzz was made by Solar Sound in London, designed for Marshall by Gary Hurst while he was still working in the Macari's Vox shop and based on his tone bender Mark I circuit with a modified tone circuit to give the Marshall version a different sound. The knobs were closer together on the first version. Only a few of these early versions have ever surfaced, so they were likely only made for a short time. Or some may be prototyped or from a short test run. The circuit was similar to the Mark I tone bender circuit with three OC75 germanium transistors. The fuzz was internally fixed at maximum. In place of the fuzz knob was the tone control labeled filter. In later production, the circuit inside was changed to a modified Tone Bender Mark II circuit with an extra limiting resistor and the regular fuzz control. However, the fuzz control remained labelled as filter. Jeff Beck has been seen using them from 1966 to 1968, both the closer knob version and the wider spaced knob version. Around 1968, the Super Fuzz got a slightly different enclosure with rounded corners. In October 1966, Jeff Beck is fired from the Yardbirds whilst on tour in Texas and his friend Jimmy Page takes over as lead guitarist. When Jeff recorded his first LP with Rod Stewart, they covered the song Shape of Things by the Yardbirds. Beck said of this, let's slow it down and make it dirty and evil. In the early days, Jeff would use a Vox Wah Wah, but on the song I Ain't Superstitious, he used a Dunlop Crybaby. On Becola, he used a color sound tone bender and booster, an Echoplex and his vibrato bar. This photo is from July 1968 and is a photo of the Jeff Beck group. We can clearly see by Jeff Beck's feet, he has a Marshall Superfuzz pedal. On Beck's use of the talk box, he says, it gets people's attention for a few seconds, but you can't tell the same jokes every time. Jeff Beck can be seen using a custom bag talk box on May 1973 on Superstition at the Santa Monica concert. He also used it on She's a Woman from his 1975 release Blow by Blow and was seen using it for a song on the BBC television programme Five Faces of the Guitar in 1974 in which he also explains its use to the host of the show. The custom electronics device The Bag was the first mass market talk box and was housed in a decorative bag slung over the shoulder like a wine bottle. It used a 30 watt driver and was released in early 1969. Notice when Jeff's using this, you can see the extra guitar strap holding the effect and why playing this actually on stage was probably a lot of bother. Let's have a look at Jeff Beck's pedals through the 1970s. In this photo from 1972 at a TV studio, we can see Jeff with a bottle of beer and a Color Sound Overdriver pedal. The Color Sound Power Boost and Overdriver are pieces of British fuss history that were very popular in the 1970s. And they are generally acknowledged to be one of the first overdrive pedals on the market. And they were sold by Macari's Music Store of London. These were essentially pre-amplifiers with a bass and treble boost, designed to drive amplifiers into overdrive or fuzz. And they were loud. The Power Boost was the original 18 volt version of the circuit. 
It was later changed to run on 9 volt power and renamed Overdriver. Jeff was a power boost and overdrive user and it can be heard all over his early 1970s studio recordings and live work, including the Blow by Blow album. In this photo we can clearly see Jeff using a Color Sound Overdriver pedal. He's playing with Max Middleton, Clive Tench and Cozy Powell. And in this photo from 1973 we can see Jeff's foot on a DeArmond Row Industries Toledo Ohio model 610 volume wire pedal. Also we can see to the right of Jeff a Color Sound Octavider and just hidden behind that is a Color Sound Overdriver pedal. The controls on the Octavider are bass volume, octave sensitivity, stomp switch for octave and a stomp switch for normal. It adds one octave below and tracks pretty nicely. And here's another photo from 1973 when Jeff was touring with Beck, Bogart and Apice. And here we can see beside his Gibson Les Paul a Diamond Wah volume pedal. And behind Jeff we can see what looks like to be a Color Sound Wah Swell pedal. Jeff gave Carmen Apice an original Vox Wah Wah pedal from his Yardbirds days to use, which Carmen did on the Japanese BBA Live LP. And here's another photo from the BBA tour. And here we can see a close up of a Crybaby Wah Wah pedal and a Color Sound Overdriver pedal. In the November 1975 guitar player interview, Jeff was asked about his effects. He replied, I have a booster and a wah-wah. It's an overdrive booster. It's just a preamp that distorts, not a fuzz box. It gives you instant power, sustain and distortion. During the wired sessions, Beck also reportedly used a Dan Armstrong green ringer, as heard on Come Dancing and Goodbye Pork Pie Hat. And here we have a great photo of Jeff's pedals from 1976 on the 23rd of May at the Roundhouse in London. Here we can see closest to us a Color Sound Octavider pedal, followed by a Color Sound Overdriver pedal, and what looks like to be some kind of a wah pedal. Behind that is a Crybaby wah wah pedal, and quite possibly this is the Thomas Organ 70s Crybaby Stereo Fuzz wah pedal, which could have been modified, but as the name implies, it's a stereo output. At this show, Jeff was supporting Alvin Lee and playing a warm-up show before the US tour to support the Wired album. This photo was taken from Boston Music Hall and now we can see that Jeff actually has a pedal board made up for him. On the far left, we can see quite a large volume control. Beside the volume control, we can see a Color Sound Power Boost pedal. And then we have two Wah Wah pedals and also an AB switch at the very end. Now you can see the pedal at the end has some kind of a toggle switch on it. This could well be the Dan Armstrong green ringer pedal. Alternatively, this could just be an AB switch to switch on and off his Echoplex. In 1976, Jeff Beck could be seen with the Jan Hammer Group live. He was still using the Color Sound Overdriver pedal. And if we look at this photo from 1976, we can clearly see the Echoplex to the right of him. Whilst working with Jan Hammer, Jeff recorded with a ring modulator for the first time. Ring modulators were first used to enable stereo broadcast of FM signal from radio waves. It eventually found its way into early electronic music and sci-fi movie effects. A ring modulator essentially uses two signals, usually one from the instrument and another from an internal oscillator. It puts out a separate third signal made from the sum and differences of the two inputs. The result is a little like an octave divider trying to handle two notes at the same time rather than a single pure note. It coughs up a dissonant mess as a result. Apparently it was Jan Hammer that actually gave Jeff Beck his Maestro Ring Modulator. In this photo we can clearly see how Jeff sets up his Echoplex and his Maestro Ring Modulator pedal at the back of the stage near the amps. And then he has his other pedals at the front of the stage. So here in this photo from 1978, the pedal board is gone. However, we still have the large volume control, the AB switch, maybe to switch on and off the Echoplex, the Color Sound Power Boost and a Wah Wah pedal. So guys, in this photo we can see a Roland RE201 Space Echo unit on top of his Marshall. And this photo would have been taken after 1974, as you can see Jeff here with his Seymour Duncan made Tele Gibb guitar. During the 1980s, Jeff used the Proco Rat Distortion pedal. On the 1989 album, Guitar Shop, on the song Where Were You, Jeff plugged his guitar into a brand new Fender Twin Reverb, an eight-year-old Fender Princeton amp set up in combination 
and also used a Proco rat distortion pedal for a little gain. The signal was then processed with a long repeating echo to provide a bit more majesty, at which point he was ready to go. By all accounts, the resulting takes on this song were among the hardest of Jeff's long and illustrious career. Jeff was still using the Proco rat distortion pedal on his 1995 world tour. In fact, the only effects that he was using around that time were a Proco rat distortion into an AB switch, which feeds either a 50 watt Mark II Marshall or a 59 reissue Baseman. The delays and echoes were added at the mixing board stage. Later on this very tour, he used a Boss Chorus to the setup and used it really only on People Get Ready. When interviewed about his concert in 2003 at BB King's Blues Club, what kind of effects did you use at that gig? Jeff replied on some verses in one tune, I used a ring modulator, that's all. In the early 90s, Jeff was using an Elise's MIDI Verb 2, which was a 16-bit reverb unit. Jeff was also a fan of the Digitech GSP21 Legend signal processor for delay, which can be heard specifically on Frankie's house. You can pick these up for as little as £100, and most users agree that the modulation effects are very, very good. He played his Strat and Tele into the Digitech, direct into the mixing desk. When Jeff was asked what effects he used on the album Crazy Legs, he replied, I used a Fender reissue amp which has since been stolen, and a Digitech GSP21 Legend. I tried a whole lot of effects, but the Digitech was ideal because there were so many inspiring preset tones, as well as a lot of silliness. We modified the presets, but it's good to see what someone else was coming up with first. Otherwise, you can spend weeks experimenting with delays or whatever. In 1993, Jeff's guitar tech Andy Roberts was asked about Jeff's touring rig. He said, at the moment for gigs with the Playboys, he's using a new basement and no effects. The man's like a walking effects unit anyway. Okay guys, now we're gonna look at Jeff's more recent setup in regards to his pedals. After the 90s, Beck ditched his rat pedal. In 1999, Paul Guy interviewed Jeff for Fuzz. When he was asked if he used a rat anymore, Jeff replied, no, no, no rat. The rat actually kills a bit of the low end. Actually, a great engineer from Sweden, he said, I don't like the rat. You know, it kills the sound you got. And I said, well, yeah, sometimes recording, of course. You substitute whatever quality low end that's gone. You can simulate that by EQing on the desk. In the same interview, he was asked if he used any pedals on the song Brush With The Blues. He replies, no, I didn't. I don't use any pedals. All I've got is an AB switch from Clean to Distorted on my Marshall. I've got a JCM 2000. I love it. It's great. It enables me to gel that vintage Marshall sound without playing a million watts. The old ones, you used to have to crank the shit out of them to get the effect. The sound guys don't like that anymore. They don't want it to bleed off the stage. And the next overdrive pedal to see action with Jeff's setup was a Klon Centur. Before Jeff started using a Klon, he would have an AB switch, which would be controlled the distortion channel on his amplifier. As Beck himself says, all I've got is an AB switch, a single switch, which kicks on the distortion channel. It adds some level and distortion. In other words, it goes to a clean channel. For certain things where you have chords in E, you can have too much fizz. And for clean, some figures that I play, little chops, they're like early stack soul, like Steve Cropper, and he would never use distortion. A lot of people think that Jimi Hendrix used a lot of distortion, but a lot of his records are very beautiful, clean, pure tone. Although he's got some power and sustain, it was clean. Okay guys, let's have a look at Jeff's pedal board from 2005. Jeff's big pedal board is hidden behind the stage and is controlled by a tech. And it features a Peterson tuner, a Hughes and Kettner rotosphere, a Boss line selector LS2, a Boss flanger BF2, a Maestro ring modulator, an EBS octabase, and it's powered by a Voodoo Lab pedal power. And also it has a Whirlwind AB switcher. On the stage, Jeff had an old Snarling Dogs Wino Wah and a white box labelled H Gain. This is believed to be some kind of a booster. Carefully, you see it's missing all the knobs and the same control knobs are on the white box instead. It's likely the wah was rehoused in that white box. In an interview for Vintage Guitar Magazine, Jeff Beck's tech 
called Steve Pryor talks about Jeff's gear. For Beck's own shows, Pryor controlled an offstage rack that included such things a Maestro ring modulator, a Mutron octave divider, and an old grey MXR power flanger. Pryor says, I make my own Megami cables with switchcraft jacks. That goes into a Snarling Dog's Super Brawl Wino Wah. Kenny Segal is a man behind that. Next, it's into a Klon Centur Overdrive. Out of that and into a delay. In 2010, Jeff's tech Steve Pryor talked to ToneQuest magazine. He says, The guitar goes in high impedance and out through the first buffer low impedance, through all the pedals and this makes them quieter and the switches operate much more quietly. When you're kicking signal into some of these old 70s effects, through a very long signal path of 40 feet and back again, you need to give it a little low impedance goosing. You saw the Snarling Dog Wah, MXR Flanger, Mutron Octave Divider and Maestro Ring Modulator and he also uses the Hughes and Kettner Rotosphere Mark II which is also rather noisy. I've done various things with those as well like replacing the 12AX7 with a 12AU7 and it does significantly improve the signal to noise ratio but then you've got to run it hotter and it's a trade off. Also present in the later stages of Jeff Beck's career was the presence of the Gig Rig Looper pedals and normally Jeff has two of these. The BSI boxes were made by Mike Hill. As Steve Pryor explains, yeah, buffered isolated splitters. Mike Hill does a lot of high-end building here in England and was 32 years at Marshall. So he makes these buffered splitters that are very discreet, very clean, very low powered consumption. And what they enable me to do is run the signal low impedance. In 2013, Jeff went on tour with Brian Wilson. He had a smaller pedal board which stocked a Snarling Dog's Wah, a Klon Centaur, a Hughes and Kettner Rotosphere, a way huge Aquapus and an MXR carbon copy. He also used a Lexicon Reflex rack in the effects loop of the Vibra King. When asked about the Snarling Dog Wah, Jeff replied, Yeah, I've got a Snarling Dog Wah. That's a radical pedal. I mean, it's one or two steps further than any wah pedal ever known. It's got an active circuit as opposed to just a battery powered toggle pot. So it kicks in a lot more dB and a lot more sweep and a lot more depth variable in the wah wah itself. You can preset it so it won't take your head off, which is good. I've seen guys play it in a bar where it's time to leave the building. Okay guys, let's take a look at one of the last iterations of Jeff Beck's pedal board. Okay, so working from left to right, we've got the Maestro ring modulator pedal, a diamond phase shifter, a Boss Super Octave OC3, one of two Gig Rig Looper pedals, a Neo Ventilator, which is a Leslie effect, an MXR flanger, an Echoplex pedal, and an Archer pedal, which is a clone of a Clon pedal, and also an MXR Super Badass Variac Fuzz. And also sitting on top of a custom audio electronics dual inductor wire is an MXR talk box pedal. Also on the top of the pedal board we can see a radial shotgun instrument buffer and splitter. And last but not least, a radial JDI passive DI box. Thanks guys so much for watching this video. I will be back soon with a new guitar history video. Until then guys, God bless, take care.